reading from Genesis chapter 2, the reason why I follow a book of the Bible is so there's some kind of continuity in my sermons. I also do it so A, I don't have to scramble about what I'm going to talk about on a Sunday, which happens quite often, and also because it gives me direction. And that is why you'll find I work through a book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 2, just the beginning of it. Um, and, and I want to say that Genesis chapter 2 is no longer poetic form, it's narrative. That by the seventh day, well, thus the heavens and earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he was doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And this is the account of the heavens and the earth as they were, when they were created. When the Lord made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. A man became a living being, now God, the Lord God, had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watered the garden, flowed from Egypt, Eden, and there it separated into four headways. The name of the first is Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic, matic resin, and onks are also there. I don't know why that little thing is in the Bible at all. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It, it winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. The Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Let us pray. And so, Lord, come and talk into our hearts and talk into our lives. Amen. I'd like to chat a bit today about the creation of man. And not so much how man is created, but I want to look at a context within which man is created and how the story actually flows out of the context. So the story of creation, we read that there were no plants on earth and no seeds had sprouted. Why? Because God had not sent rain. So, the reason why there are no plants is because there is no rain. But you read there's some kind of mist hangs over the land. But there's another reason why the, the plants haven't really developed. And listen to this. The other reason is this. There were no plants on the earth and no seeds on, 
sprout because he had not sent any rain. And there was no one to cultivate the land. Fascinating, eh? So, God has not developed things yet because he has no one to look after what he has created. Isn't that interesting, eh? And the re- it's fascinating that the Hebrew word here means to dress, to cultivate, to till, or to work. So God does not allow creation to develop properly until there is someone to look after it. Now, the next we read is how God takes soil and he forms and shapes man, much as a potter forms a man. And then he goes and he puts the man into the garden. And we read, the Lord took the man, put him into the garden of Eden, Eden to dress it and to keep it. The word translated as dress comes from a Hebrew word which means work, as in cultivating, as in manual labor. So it puts him in a garden to work. So it's very clear here what man is meant to do. He's meant to develop and cultivate the land. It's very, very clear. And the place of the land is in fact the place where man works. Now what I find fascinating about this thing about man being put in the garden to work the land is that it precedes the coming of Eve. It precedes the relationship of Adam and Eve and the union of Adam and Eve and it precedes Adam's love for Eve. It precedes any formalization of worship of man. Adam shares a special relationship with God. He talks with him and speaks to him as a friend in the garden. But the first places of worship, the first altars of Cain and Abel have not in fact been erected yet. So work precedes worship. It precedes sin. So work cannot be a consequence of sin. (laughs) We don't work because we live in a sinful world. It precedes sin. And so before all of this, before love, before worship, before sin, man is mandated by God to work. This means that the tasking of man to work is primary in the Bible. It comes before anything else. It is a primary tasking. And so the tasking of man is fundamental to human existence of man and the planet. That is what it is. Now the tasking of of man by God work gives direction to man. It means he is created in a context of purpose. The tasking of man work gives meaning to man. He is cultivating that which God has created. The tasking of man work gives purpose to man. He knows what he needs to do. And also the tasking of man by God becomes the primary means by which he can support himself. That is why Eve is not there already. Eve only comes after Adam can provide for her. (laughs) And so, through this tasking of God, of man, man, in fact, becomes a partner with God in the ongoing creation process. Man becomes a partner with God in maintaining what God has created. 
That's what happens. And so it is this context, this garden, this work, which is the primary space within which God, man experiences God. Nowhere else. In the context of his tasking and the context of his work. That is where he experiences God most profoundly. The second thing is this. It is not only work that man is tasked with by God. That passage in, in Genesis 2.15, the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Interesting word they keep. The Hebrew word for it, shomar, literally means to hedge something with thorns so as to protect it. Now you know where I'm going. So man's primary task is to work the garden, keep it in order, and protect it. And the word used here is, is that it's, it's, it refers to a, a biblical, a Hebrew legal law that specifies the responsibility of one who undertakes to guard and look after something that is not their own, a minor. If a minor is left without parents and has needs somebody to look after it and care for it and protect it, that's the word that is used to do that. So man has this responsibility to protect and guard that which God has created. Now, what exactly what, from what God had to protect everything, we don't know. It's neither defined in the text or, or hinted at in the text. We don't, it doesn't say what he's got to protect creation from. And this is before the fall. But the importance of this is that protecting the land is on the same level, in the same sentence, as working the land. In other words, it is as important as man's tasking to work. He's tasked to work and just as important to protect that which God created. That's his tasking. And so this tasking of the man to protect also becomes, comes before Eve. It comes before sin. It comes before worship. And so into this whole story, without it even saying it, but it implies it, comes almost a responsibility and a morality to man towards that which God has created. Genesis tells us that the earth is not ours. It belongs to the one who created it, who formed it. But now, with tragic hindsight, I don't know how many thousands of years later, we know what the earth had to be protected from. It had to be protected from the man that God created. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? That he who is meant to protect becomes the abuser. They're fascinating. This whole understanding of man being responsible to protect the earth gets carried out through the Torah. There's <laughs> in in Exodus twenty three there's a verse, a very strange verse. Angus Buckham actually lives by this verse. It says, For six years plant the land and gather in what it produces, but in the seventh year let it rest. And do not harvest anything that grows on it. The poor may eat what grows there, the wild animals can have what is left. 
Do the same with your vineyards and your olive trees. Work six days a week, but do not work on the seventh day so that your slaves and foreigners who work for you and your animals can rest. And then in Leviticus, this is played out. In Leviticus 26, he says, If you live according to my laws and obey my commands, I will send you rain at the right time so the land will produce crops and the trees will bear fruit. Angus Buckham actually testifies to the truth of that in his own life. He says, Your trees, crops will be so plentiful that you will, you will still be harvesting grain when it is time to pick grapes. And you will be picking grapes when it's time to plant grain. You will have all that you want to eat and you can live in safety in your land. And then he goes on and God says, if you will not obey my commands, in other words, these commands about the land, you will be punished. And he talks about a whole lot of things that will happen to them, which will include the enemies overcoming them, their cities being destroyed, their lands being stripped bare. And then there is this verse. Now listen to this verse. They have refused to obey God. They will be punished. Everything will be taken away from them. And then God says, in Leviticus 26, 34, then the land will enjoy the years of rest. You did not give it. It will lie abandoned and get its rest while you are in exile. What is that actually say? Hey? Look after the land. Because if you don't, I will destroy you. And I will give the land a place to recover. <laughs> That's about conservation, isn't it? I think no one has articulated more profoundly man's responsibility to the earth than Pope Francis. And Pope Francis wrote this, and will be part of our prayer just now. It says, Francis of Assisi reminds us that our common home is like a sister. It's a sister because it was created by God. That which is created by God is our brothers and sisters. A common home is like a sister with whom we share our life and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. Now our sister cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by irresponsible use and abuse of the gods with which God of the goods with which God has endowed her. We have come to see ourselves as her lords and master, entitled to plunder her at will. The violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, is reflected in the symptoms of the sickness evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and all forms of life. And this is why the earth itself, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. She groans in travail. We have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of this earth. Our very bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air and we receive life and refreshment from her waters. Profound words. Thank you.